So today I want to do something a little bit different. Usually I keep my videos very concrete and practical, but today I want to talk about more of a soft topic. And sorry if this turns out to be almost kind of a rant, but I want to talk about what I think of as the keyboard generation or the, the desk generation. No matter if you have a sitting desk or a standing desk, we're still sort of a je desk generation. So the reason this topic has become kind of more important to me now is that I'm developing this sort of problem with my hand all the way from the lower parts of like the hand and up, up to the shoulder and reasonably I, I'm guessing this has to do with the amount of time I spend in front of a computer I think my friend put it nicely when he said that it's easier to count the hours you're not spending in front of a computer rather than counting the hours you do spend in front of a computer that goes for a lot of us and maybe that goes for you and that's not because I like play games during the night or anything like this I mean I, I'm especially now I really try to focus solidly on getting my eight hours of sleep but the thing is still that my full-time job as a PhD student it means that I spend a lot of time in front of the computer. I'm writing simulations, so I do a lot of programming. So my full-time job, daytime job, is at the computer. And, and then I do entrepreneurial stuff. I do this kind of stuff, which means that I also do video editing, which is also in front of the computer at nighttime. And I mean, that's not, I'm not trying to complain. I mean, I love that stuff. That's fantastic. That's why I do it, right? The problem is that it necessarily has to be in front of the computer. This is also kind of a, a reason that I'm doing these videos outside of the computer. I mean, I, I know that some of these topics would be much more suitable to do in a screencast format. And I'm I'm trying to do as much of that as possible. It's just that it's really difficult for me to rationalize spending even more time in front of the computer. I mean, at some point it kind of becomes a health hazard, right? And this is why I'm trying to find topics that are discussable, if you think about the series Code Walks, that are discussable off a computer. But that's enough about sort of the, the personal issues or, or how I'm thinking about this personally. What I want to talk about is, since the invention of the modern computer as we know it, and since the invention of programming in the modern sense as we know it today, we've been stuck at computers, writing code, writing characters. Programming is still, if you think about it, if you think about languages, right? Human languages are very unstructured. If you think about the grammar, right? As in uh, the formal grammar of language. The formal grammar of language is very difficult to specify because there are so many irregularities regardless of the language. Programming languages are not very irregular. And note here that when I'm saying regular, I don't mean regular as in the regular languages in the Chomsky hierarchy. I mean as in that they don't have a lot of irregularities. I mean, you, you can specify the language and then you can easily determine whether a, a particular program adheres to the specification of the programming language or not. In other words, compiles or not, right? I mean, just, just the fact that we have compilers is an obvious proof that the languages that we're using are describable to 100%. You can say this program adheres to the constraints of the, of the programming language. In other words, it's, it's, it's syntactically correct, right? We're not saying semantically correct. We're just saying this program syntactically makes sense, right? So this is all trivial stuff, but I just want to sort of get that out there so that we agree that programming languages are very formal. They are super structured. The reason I'm saying that is that if you disregard the semantic elements of, of a programming language, and if you disregard the semantics of a program, if you disregard, for example, a variable name, right? You, I mean, variables have to be at least one letter and there has to be a maximum, I guess. Right? But regardless, I mean, if you just think about passwords, the combinatorial complexity is super high. So like enumerating all of the possible combinations of variable names requires massive search space. So that's impractical. But the same problem is not true for, for keywords in a, in a programming language. The, the control structures, right? If, else, while, arguments, types, class, using, import, module, all of this stuff, right? So I'm not sure if you've taken any course or perhaps dug into the internet. I haven't taken any courses in compilers, but I've, I've dug into it in, on the internet. Um, there, there's actually a super interesting playlist on compilers and, and the Chomsky hierarchy. I, I mean, this, this playlist, there's, there's, it's from some university, I can't remember which one, but the guy is uh, very entertaining and it's an excellent playlist. I highly recommend you to watch that. I'll, I'll post that in, in the description. But, but if you think about the tokenization step of a compiler, in other words, when you read the string, the string that is the program, and then you tokenize the pieces of the string into different things, such as the keyword module, the keyword class, right? 
when you do that, that, that step of the, of, the compile, of the compilation process, you, you can reduce the search space of possible values or possible tokens that you can have at a particular location depending on what tokens you've seen before. So if you, in C Sharp for example, if you see the keyword class, you would expect it to be followed by the token curly brace. And if you see the, the token or the keyword semicolon, for example, you know that the line has been terminated, which means that the next symbol has to be from the set of symbols that are uh, allowed to be used at the beginning of a statement or an expression. So you can't start a new line, quotation marks, new line, with equals, for example, if, in some particular language, right? I, I guess that would be the case in C Sharp. It doesn't really make any sense to start a new expression with equals in that language. Which totally depends on the language. My point is that the search space is, of course, I'm not saying that this is something strange. I mean, I, I'm just trying to really underline that obviously the size of the search space is, is less. You have a set of expected possible tokens. You have a set of tokens from which you assume the next token will be of when you're parsing a program. So it's not as in that the next token can always be any of the possible tokens at any given time. The search space is is smaller than that. So the reason I'm saying that is that this brings me to thinking that I'm not saying it's trivial, but is it really that complicated to stop typing individual characters and start typing tokens of expressions? Why am I typing, when I, when I want to construct a string, why am I typing S-T-R-I-N-G? Why? Because at that particular location, when my cursor is at that particular location, there's a set of possible things that I could type. So couldn't I somehow navigate that hierarchy of things that I could be could type there? Whether that's through voice, or whether that's visual, or something completely different, whether that's like mechanical, right? You could even imagine pulling the levers. I'm not saying that would be a progress, but I'm just saying hypothetically. It doesn't matter, I'm just saying that to me, it sounds like moving away from typing the individual characters seems like a smart thing to do. Any problem in computer science can be solved with another level of abstraction, except the problem of too many levels of abstraction. So, so to me, this feels like the natural step. Probably I'm underestimating the complexity, right? Because otherwise I guess we would have this. But I'm just trying to be another person pushing for this and saying that I would so welcome this development if voice-controlled programming started to act on the token level rather than on the character level, I'd jump into it. The early adoption, right? As soon as it works kind of okay, I would totally jump into it. That would be fantastic. I have a colleague, a research colleague, who, who is finishing up his dissertation and works on visual programming. So again, it's, it's, it's less trivial than you would imagine. But there are ways of producing programs using visual constructs rather than using individual characters. And if you think about this, I mean, this really feels like, try, try to think ahead in time, right? Like this feels like inevitably the evolution has to move in this direction. And this is why I'm saying the keyboard generation or the desk generation, right? We could say the monitor generation or the terminal generation. As we move into VR, for example, think about this. As we move into VR, you'll, you'll program Minority Report style with a VR set, right? I'm totally waiting for, for VR programming. Do you really want to have your VR set and then a visual keyboard and then you use your controls to type on your visual keyboard in your VR world? What? Doesn't that seem totally inefficient or if you want to put your VR set on and then still have to type physically on your physical keyboard then it's just another visual representation of the screen right what we actually should be looking for isn't that more like you put on your VR set and then you shuffle things around using your your VR controls right right in the 3d visual world you shuffle things around and through that you compose a program because that's what you're actually doing right we're not writing programs, we're composing programs of Lego bricks, where if you put them in particular orders, you get a particular outcome. You take these Lego bricks, you stack them here and there in particular combinations, and based on that, you get your program. So isn't that more like what we want? Doesn't that just kind of make you go, oh man, don't be so cool to program in that way. I just go crazy when I think about that. That sounds super awesome. And also it just, somehow it just feels kind of natural. It would be like taking physical things and composing these different physical things. It's suddenly like architecture. It's suddenly a lot more like 
building something, which is, in my mind, as it should be, which is what programming actually is. We're actually building something. It's just that the complexity is so high, so it's difficult to depict visually in the physical world. But in the digital world, right? I, I really think we could actually do it. And of course, there's the whole notion of like the actual natural language portions, like variable names and method names and class names and things like this. And honestly, I have no good solutions for that. I don't know how to do that, whether we should go like voice commands and then autocorrect or use the keyboard or I don't know, but you know, multimodal, maybe we could use multiple combinations. Maybe we could sort of lean style, right? We don't have to solve all of the problems at once. Let's start with visual rep representation. Let's then move into visually reorganizing the programs. And then at these earlier locations, we'll use the keyboard whenever we need to type a name or something like this. I don't know. I mean, we'll find solutions. But just think about the implications of this. So firstly, you can get off your desk. Wouldn't that be amazing? Right? You could still sit at your desk if you want to. Of course, you could just sit down, put on your VR set and go, right? And I mean, the people have all kinds of bodily variations. So of course, this might not necessarily be an improvement to have to do bigger motions with the hands this might not be an improvement for all people but for these people you know they, they could still use the keyboard style or they could use uh, smaller movements I mean one size does not have to fit all I'm just saying like we can we can expand our thinking of how to to write programs we can expand the, the, the practice of how to write programs so that would be one thing right you can get off your desk another thing yeah. you could have your programming environment with you all the time I mean just think about how bulky a big physical monitor is. Think about how we look back now at very bulky TV screens, right? And then we say, oh, that's so silly. I can't believe we had these massive, big and heavy TVs, right? We'll probably do the same thing for computer monitors. They're bulky and they're heavy and then we have this massive keyboard and all that stuff. And it's all just software anyway. So why do we need this, these physical things? So what I was trying to push for is portability. If you think about cloud computing, for example, it's just a kind of another step in this direction. The situation used to be that if you were running your own product, you had to run your own servers back in the days. You had to deploy your own email server and your web server and la di da di da in your own facilities. But now with cloud, you just buy into a cloud and then you scale on demand. So you use, for example, Amazon's web servers or whoever's web server you're using. Same thing for email, same thing for file sharing, and communication, Slack, all of this stuff, Trello, all of this stuff, it's all in the cloud, right? There's, there's no point in having that physical hardware at your locations. And maybe it's kind of a sloppy analogy, but I'm just thinking maybe it could be sort of the same thing with keyboards and monitors and things like this. They just turn into part of the IDE and the IDE turns into an app. So you interact with your source code and your source code has a representation. And currently this representation is all text. It doesn't matter if you use Sublime or Vim or Emacs or Atom or Visual Studio or WebStorm or Eclipse or whatever, whatever, all of these things, right? It doesn't matter, it's still just text. So the representation is essentially the same in all of these IDEs or these text editors because it's text, they edit text. But what I'm saying is that when we push this further, you'll have apps that have completely different representations of your program. So, so, so on, a, on a basic level, you have visual representations and sound representations and tactile representations. But even beyond that, I mean, that would be cool, right? You could, you could 3D print your program, for example. That'd be amazing. I have no idea if that would even be feasible, but whatever. But, but that's on a first level. But on the second level, even within the context of visual representations, you have different vendors doing different visual representations, right? Because one size doesn't fit all and we all kind of think differently. So instead of trying to use the same visual representation for all people, we have different visual representations and you can choose whichever visual representation suits your style. So if I try to sum up that, I, I think those are multiple points, right? We're talking about portability, but we're also talking about customizability at very low cost. And if you start to push that further, I think this is, this is where it becomes really kind of interesting. Because programming today is textual in some sense, right? You use, you have to, you don't really have to, but it, but it significantly helps if you know language before you start to write programs. It's textual. You have to be able to differentiate between alphanumeric characters. You have to be able to make out words. But when we start to move into this really visually rich and a very interactive experience of programming, maybe you don't even need to know language when you start to write your first programs. When you write your 
first toy programs, right? I'm talking about like education, where maybe we could push programming to a very, very, very early age, to the age where you don't even know how to write sentences yet. Think about that game for kids where you have triangles and balls and squares and you push them through uh, different holes. Right? It kind of become that pattern matching exercise where you just pull things back and forth and put them here and there and with these Lego blocks build the program. It's kind of like that uh, Scratch thing. There's, there's this program called Scratch that teaches kids to program. I haven't looked extensively at this, but it seems to me that they're very much using that type of thinking where they're trying to think in terms of tokens rather than in terms of language. And I think that's really solid. That's really the direction we want to move in because I really believe that we could probably make programming a very, very early part of education, right? It could become like when you learn, start to learn about language and uh, math, right? Like very, very small kids. Even maybe before that, maybe we could have, even have games, right? For even smaller kids. Yeah, but now I'm going off topic. So let me wrap this up here. I hope it was okay to follow along with that rant. If this freaks you out and you really want me to stay away from this kind of videos, please let me know and I will try and not do them again. But beyond that, we are the keyboard generation or the desk generation, the workstation generation. And it's really, really time that we seriously start to think about how we can move away from this, I would even venture to say, physically straining type of activity. It's even kind of absurd. It's like people will look back at our generations and will say that, wow, that, that was kind of medieval, the way they were working. You can even feel it now that it's, it's primitive. It's very, very primitive compared to how you could imagine that we should be writing programs. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe if you want more rounds like this, but also more importantly, a lot more concrete talks about code, about software, about architecture. I'll see you in the next one.